Okay, so uh, we're going to be talking in the next final two classes about uh, Hopfield networks and Boltzmann machines. This, this is an, uh, these are entire topics by themselves. We can have entire courses devoted to Boltzmann machines and their formalisms. We're going to dismiss the entire lot in just two classes. So, assuming this works, yes, beautiful. Here's what we've seen so far. We've seen neural networks for computations such as the one on top, feed forward networks where you have an input that goes in layer wise through the net and something comes out. So the whole thing is a directed network. But we haven't actually looked at networks of the second kind where the output of a neuron goes back to itself. Even when we did have these cute little figures with the output looping back, that was actually just a recurrent network where the actual computation was fully feed forward. What happens when we actually have looping networks? So that's what we're going to look at today. Let's consider this very simple neural looping, net looping network with uh, five neurons. And we're going to consider threshold activation. So if the input exceeds some threshold, then, oh my, what happened? Yes, what? <laughs> what is happening, yeah. Paul? There's something strange happening here. You guys might just get lucky. If the equipment fails, we'll cancel class. Okay. It's good for me as well. <laughs> it's flashing back and forth. What's yeah, it's something with the with the HP Live Mac near your laptop. I'm not sure what Okay, let's just yeah, assume it's stable. So Consider this network, right? We have five neurons. Each neuron has connections coming from all other, every, all the remaining four neurons. Every neuron is connecting out to all remaining four neurons. And we will consider threshold activation. So if the weighted sum of all of the inputs plus the bias, if you're considering a bias, exceeds a threshold, the neuron will fire, otherwise it will not, right? And to simplify matters, I'm going to assume that the weights are symmetric. So because this is a looping network, you can actually imagine symmetric networks connections, right? So the weight from neuron A to neuron B is the same as the weight from neuron B to neuron A. And now each neuron is just a threshold activation perceptron. It receives input from every other neuron and outputs signals to every other neuron. Now, can anybody take a guess? Say, let's say I start off by randomly setting these neurons to some pattern. Then can anyone take a guess as to how this will behave? Anyone? Is it going to be a single step computation after that or will it be loopy? It's going to loop, right? So here's what will happen. By the way, this is what's called a Hopfield network. And at each time, the neuron receives a, what I will call a field, which is the weighted sum of the outputs of all the other neurons plus its own bias. If, now, because this is a threshold network activation, remember, the threshold act, how does the threshold activation operate? If the weighted sum is positive, then the output becomes plus one. If the weighted sum is negative, the output becomes a minus one. But there's a different way of thinking about it. If the output has currently got some value, if the output is currently negative and the weighted sum is positive, the output is going to flip. If the output is currently positive and the weighted sum is negative, the output is going to flip. Otherwise, the output doesn't flip. Because, uh, so what this means is that if the sign of the field and the current output are the same, then that neuron does nothing. Otherwise, it flips. So 
if, alternately stated, if the product of the output of the neuron and the field is negative, it's going to flip, otherwise it won't flip. If it's negative, it means the two are different signs, right? So a neuron flips if the weighted sum of other neurons' outputs is of the opposite sign to its own current input. But this may cause other neurons to flip. Because imagine I set it up, right? And some neuron is in a situation where it's not going to flip because its own sign matches its field. But then some other neuron in the network found itself in a situation where it was, it, it was required to flip in order for its sign to match its field. But when that neuron flips, this changes the field at all the other neurons, and some of them might flip, right? And so, if you have something of this kind, for instance, blues are whites, blues are ones, yellows are minus ones, if the sign of the field at any neuron opposes its own sign, it will flip. For example, this might flip. But because this one flipped, then this may cause the field over here to change. And so that's going to cause this guy to flip. But because this guy flips, this may cause, for instance, the field over here to change. That guy could flip. And now because that guy flipped, this may cause the field over here to change and cause this one to flip again, right? So you're going to get behavior of this kind, where you just set the neurons in some pattern. You've got a connection of, a collection of weights. And each neuron is influencing the field at, some other at the other locations. Some of these neurons will flip because their sign doesn't match the field. But when they flip, they're going to change to cause other neurons to flip. And this whole thing is going to, going to continue. So this was uh, 120 evolutions of a loopy network, a little simulation. And you can, you know, you can see these things flashing around. It's kind of pretty, right? So how long will this continue? Anybody want to guess? Pardon me? Is there any guarantee? No. So how many of you think this can continue forever? And how many think it can't? Both of you are right, right? But it cannot. And there's a very simple for reason for why it cannot. And the reason is this. Look at it this way. A neuron flips if the sign doesn't match the uh, current value, right? So y plus and y minus are the response of the neuron just before the activation is applied. So the field has come in, y minus is the current state of the neuron, then it responds, and it, when it responds, it becomes y plus. So plus and minus are before and after, right? Now, here's the guarantee. Once it has flipped, these two guys, the field and the value, are going to match sign. If the field is negative, the value becomes negative, right? Before they flip, before it flips, the field and value might match sign or might not. If they match sign, then y plus is the same as y minus. So this guy and this guy are the same. The difference in the uh, values, so if I multiply the output by the field, this has some value. The difference in this value, uh, the, the difference in this value after the neuron has responded and before the neuron has responded is zero if the neuron doesn't flip its sign. What will it be if it flips its sign? Will it be positive or negative? It's always going to be positive, right? Because after it has flipped, the neuron matches its own field. The sign of the neuron matches its own field. Before it has flipped, the sign of the neuron doesn't match its own field. So when the neuron flips, this guy is positive, guaranteed. This guy is negative, also guaranteed. So what this means is I'm subtracting a negative quantity from a positive quantity. This net is going to be positive, right? So this term here is guaranteed to be positive every time a neuron flips. So every flip of a neuron is locally guaranteed to increase 
the product of the output of the neuron and the field of the neuron, right? And the exact amount by which it's going to increase it is going to be two times the output of the neuron times the field of the neuron. Now the output is always binary, right? So it's simply going to be two times the magnitude of the field. The output is either plus one or minus one, the way we set it up. So now consider this guy here. I'm considering the sum over all of the neurons of this term, which is the product of the output of the neuron in the field. I'm just calling it the value D, right? Now, any time a neuron flips, I know that this term here is going to be positive, right, after it has flipped. If the neuron doesn't flip, so uh, that it's going to be negative, right, for each of the neurons. So if I look at, if I consider any single neuron, and if I look at this D value before it has, after it has flipped, and the D value before it has flipped, and take the difference, this difference is guaranteed to be positive, right? I'm just summing this over all the neurons. This is the same term that we just looked at. And specifically, it's going to be two times the output of the specific neuron that did flip times the field of the neuron. Again, anything complicated over here? It's fairly straightforward, right? We haven't done any complex math. Here's the beauty of it. So look at this D guy, right? What is the maximum value that D can take? The maximum value that D can take is going to be, you know, this is the sum over all the neurons of the product of, okay, just take a look at this. I just move this Y i in. That's going to be summation over i and j of W i j times Y i Y j, right? Plus summation over i, Y i times B i. And so that's all I've written. That's over here. What is the largest value this can take? There's an upper bound. We have the weights. The upper bound for Y i Y j is one. In the best case, it's going to be one. Or you know, the magnitude will be one. So the upper bound for W times Y i W i j times Y i Y j is going to be the magnitude of Y i W i j, right? Similarly, the upper bound of B i Y i is just the magnitude of B i. And so this term D has an upper bound, right? On the other hand, the change in D, that thing has a lower bound. And what would the lower bound be? That is going to be two times the mag this magnitude over here, correct? So every time a neuron flips, D increases by at least this much but D has a maximum value, right? Now is, tell me, is the evolution of the network going to continue forever? Anyone? I haven't given out tokens, so I'm gonna call point fingers. You there? Is the evolution going to continue forever? Why not? So just give out the tokens, everybody's sleeping, right? I thought I was gonna spare these guys. <laughs> and, but I thought it was the last, where is the pen? Okay. So can somebody tell me why this will not continue forever? Yes. So basically you're going to get something like, I have D max is going to be N times delta D min, right? That's a maximum number. Once delta D, the, the, in the worst case, after it has flipped whatever this n times, D has reached its maximum value, at which point no neuron can flip anymore. This is a guarantee, right? And so there's a, there's a bounded number of flips. And so this is not going to continue forever. What can we tell about what happens when it does stop? To see that, let's define something called the energy of the network. The energy of the network is just minus of half of this D term that we just computed. There's a, the minus over here is just you know a convention thing, ignore it. I can call it plus bias or minus bias, it doesn't really matter, right? So this is what we will define the as the energy of the network, and this one 
every time the hop field net evolves, every time a, a neuron flips, this energy D was guaranteed to increase, right? Consequently, the energy is guaranteed to decrease because the energy is minus of the minus half of D, right? So the story so far is that a hop field network is a loopy binary network with symmetric connections. Every neuron attempts to align itself with the field of the neuron. What we mean by align is that it tries to match its own sign to the sign of the field of the neuron. Given an initial configuration, the neurons in the net will begin to flip to align themselves with their field. And each evolution of the network, but when they flip, this can cause the field at other neurons to change, potentially making them flip. And each evolution of the network is guaranteed to decrease the energy of the network because the energy is lower bounded and the decrements are upper bounded. So this means the network is guaranteed to converge to a stable state in a finite number of steps, yes. Um, Professor, could you just uh, provide a use case for? We will. But there is a poll. The first poll is 2005, six and seven. Cannot be found? Yeah. So, Disha, can you check? It says you can't find the, find the polls. Are you sure, sure you guys can't find the polls? Okay, the first is fine. Okay, it doesn't matter. Just solve, do the ones that you can. Okay, it doesn't matter. We'll work with whatever we can. Right? Just check the setting for the next poll. Okay. All right, this was easy. Anyways, let's skip the poll. So, yeah, there's some mess. We set it up, but these things happen. Right now, this week, this is our week for messing up, right? Homework for this one. Anyway. anyway. So, hop field nets are loopy networks whose output activations evolve over time, number one. They will not evolve forever, as we just saw. And now, I'm claiming that a hop field network can be viewed as an infinitely deep multi-layer perceptron. Can anybody tell me why? So who is number five? So can you tell me why a hop field network can be viewed as a infinitely deep MLP? So, but it's looping, right? Yeah. And an MLP is not. So, does anybody want to tell me how? Okay, let me explain how, right? I can have these five neurons. Now, I can just draw the same five neurons like so, and now I have a full connection from five neurons to five neurons, okay? And then I can have the same five neurons over here, and I can have the same set of connections. If these weights are identical to these weights, this is like unrolling the computation of the hop field net for one time step, right? The evolution is just infinitely long. Make sense to everybody, right? So hop field net is basically, if there's nothing magical about looping, it's just that it's an infinitely deep network, MLP, where the parameters are tied. Every layer has exactly the same parameters as every other layer. If you ever wondered what that would be like, this is what it is, right? But this has some interesting outcomes, right? So I'm gonna define the energy of the network. We just did this. Where did this energy concept come from? So for this energy concept, we're gonna go back to physics, something called dipoles. This uh, concept of hop field nets actually came from, uh, came from, uh, from the study of ferromagnetic materials. Now, magnetic materials have these little things, these molecules are dipoles, they have a magnetic moment and every molecule is gonna to try to align itself with the local magnetic field. 
So each of these magnetic molecules is a dipole because it's a magnet. So it's going to try to align itself with the local field. And when it, if the uh, dipole is, say, north-south and the field is south-north, it's going to flip, right? Now it's going to align itself with the field. But when it flips, where did the field itself come from? The field has two components. The field is a result of the magnetic field from all the other dipoles, the local field, plus whatever external influence you might have. So when this dipole flips, it's going to change the field everywhere else. And now those dipoles are going to flip. And this whole evolution can continue. So this is a, called a spin glass. Originally by this paper by, from this paper called Icing and Lens, 1924. It's a very nice paper. So you can think of it this way. The total field, what is the total field at a current dipole? The total field at the current dipole is the influence of all of the other dipoles, right? So it's going to be the sum over all of the other dipoles of the dipole, uh, the, the uh, dipole moment itself times an interaction component where this interaction Jij depends on the distance between the two dipoles, the dielectric constant, and a bunch of other um, other uh, characteristics. Other, and then there's also an external magnetic field that you might impose, maybe by placing a magnet on the side, right? So the total field at any dipole is simply going to be this guy for any individual dipole. And You've all done your physics. I'm sure physics was imposed on you as it was on me many years ago. And so when I have a magnetic dipole in a field, what is the potential energy at that point because of the dipole? Anyone remember? <laughs> Q. <laughs> it's simply the product of the magnetic uh, dipole and the field itself, right? And so you're going to find first, here's the response. The response of the current dipole, it stays in its current position. If it's aligned with the field, it's going to flip if it's, if it's misaligned. And the dipoles will keep flipping. A flip five dipole changes the field at other dipoles, some of which will flip, which will change the field at the current dipole, which may flip, and so on. And this is going to continue. When will it stop? For this, we define something called the Hamiltonian of the system, which you might re recognize as being related to the potential energy of the system, right? So the Hamiltonian of the system is the total energy of the system. The total energy of the system has to do, is going to be the product of the field and the dipole value itself summed over all of the dipoles. It's proportional to that. It's actually defined as minus of half of summation xi field at the position, right, the ith position. And so if you work it out, this is simply going to, there's the minus half, where did the half come from? It's minus of summation over all of the dipoles. And you can do this increment left to right, this the uh, summation left to right because the interaction is symmetric, right? So it's summation over i, j, 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 i, x, i, x, j minus the second term. Now this begins to look familiar, right? And so what happens with the dipole, the, dip the, the, the uh, uh, spin glass, the dipoles are going to keep flipping. And each time they flip, this we know from, know from our physics, when you have something at a very high energy, they're going to sort of try to come to a lower potential energy position, right? You just leave your, you draw, you, if you leave a ball up there at a height of 100 meters, why does it come down? It's losing its potential energy. It's, it's exchanging it for kinetic energy. It's not just hanging there. Everything tends to go down towards a lower energy configuration. So this thing is going to flip, right? And how exactly will it flip? The potential energy of the system, the Hamiltonian of the system, is going to be a function of the configuration. And so if I could lay all of the configurations out on an axis, which you really can't because you know it's like a multidimensional thing, but if I could hypothetically, then it's going to have some shape of this kind and whenever you initialize the system at some point, it's going to begin to evolve. And the guarantee that we just had, if things were deterministic, is that every time it evolves, this energy is going to decrease, right? And so the spin glass has this uh, characteristic that if you started off in some configuration, it's going to roll down this energy contour. 
till it comes to a local minimum. And if it's at a local minimum, if you jiggle it a bit, it's going to come back to the local minimum. So any small jitter from the stable configuration returns the, the uh, system to its original state. Now, we might have heard of things like shape memory alloys and such like. They also have the same behavior, that they have a local minimum in the energy. And if you distort it, then they're going to sort of wander back to the local minimum in the energy, right? So what this means is that if I start off at some local config minimum and I jitter it, the system is going to remember the configuration where you started off from. So I could move this system from here all the way up here and it's going to roll back right down and it's going to end up at the local minimum again. So our Hopfield net is basically a strict computational analog of the spin glass. And that's where this definition of energy came from, right? This is energy, this is uh, an, an analogous to the potential energy of the spin glass. And so the system is going to evolve until this energy hits a local minimum. By the way, so this bias term, I keep writing, uh, writing the bias, but having a bias term is the same as having one neuron whose value is pegged to one. This is, a, this is something that we've been using for uh, since the second class, remember? And so often in my equations, I won't have an explicit bias term. I'm just going to look at it as a weighted sum of, of bits, okay? So dropping the bias term, I can define my energy like so. And once I initialize the system, it's going to, the energy is going to keep decreasing until it arrives at a local minimum in the energy. So the network will evolve until it arrives at a local minimum in the energy contour. Now, what can I think of when I, th uh, what can I think of these local energy minima as? These can be thought of as stored patterns. I have a network, right? And it's basically this infinitely deep network. And if I start it with some configuration, it's going to keep evolving until it arrives at some pattern. And that pattern, if I start off from that pattern and jitter the pattern, and I don't jitter it enough, it's going to come right back to that pattern, right? This is what is, this is a form of memory, right? It's remembering things. I give you a pattern, and it's remembering that pattern. If I'm if I noisify the pattern, if I modify the pattern, it comes back to the pattern. Now, this is what's called a content addressable memory. How many of you have heard of this term? So, what's a cam? Anybody else heard of it? So, how does memory normally work in a computer? Anybody know? If you, want to add, if you want to recall a specific value in memory, how do you do it? You check an address, right? Every memory entry has an address. It's in the index in your array. It's whatever memory address you've got on the hardware. And so when you want to recall something, you don't know what is in the address. You only know the address, and you go to the address and pull out whatever is in it. Yes, Abhi? It's basically physical address to physical memory, right? So that's, so that's how you would normally uh, recall something. You say, you know, the address, address is 312 or, you know, 0, uh, 083, whatever, right? You go to that location in memory and you, you pull out whatever bit or bit pattern is at that location. This is address or location indexed memory, right? But there's a different way of doing it. If I have a pattern and if I remember it somewhat vaguely, if I can recall based on this vague recollection of what the pattern must hold, that's a content addressable memory. You don't address by location, you look you address by content. And this is a different way of thinking about memory and it's very important as well, right? How do you operate? You don't operate by uh, location-based indexing. You remember something and whatever you remember sort of pulls up the entire memory. That's how, we, that's how our own memories operate most of the time, right? We have content addressable memories in our head. So this is a content addressable memory. So here's an, here are some examples of content addressable memories if I can play the video, right? <laughs> 
So here's a picture to the left. This has been stored in a cam. That picture has been degraded to the one in the middle. They just added a bunch of noise. And then you let the system evolve. This has been put into a hop field net. So you have a hop field net which remembers that original pattern. Every pixel, it's just a bunch of pixels which are ones and zeros, right? So I can just make a network for it. When you add noise, it's like changing, flipping some of these pixels. And then you let the whole thing evolve. When it evolves, it reconstructs the Bugs Bunny. Or oh, here's the second one. This is Chip and Dale, Disney characters. In this case, the lower portion of the, the uh, image has been erased. And then you let the system evolve. It, it pulls back the entire pattern. Or here's a very nice one that I actually found on the web. So let me see if I can do this. So they're storing different patterns in the Hopfield network, as you can see. And then they sort of scramble the pattern. They let it evolve. And depending on where you begin from, it's going to pull up one of the memories. So this is. So you can see how this works, right? Pretty impressive. So someone asked, what's it useful for? It's useful as a content addressable memory and many more things, right? Along the same line. Sir? Yeah. How do they like actually know that? Because I feel like when you degrade it, you just like flip everything so it keeps so red. It isn't. So as you can see, it isn't, right? Uh, and so our problem is, first, how does this work? This is very easy, right? We can write any odd equation, but this is just this little uh, computation. You can think of it as an MLP, which is infinitely deep. And so you can set the initial values. And this is just your straightforward MLP computation. You can do it incrementally one neuron at a time, or you can do the whole lot together. And you can keep computing. And now this is an infinitely deep neural network. So when will you stop computing? Anyone want to, take, want to guess? Hmm? Pardon me? When the output no longer changes, and you know that there's a finite depth beyond which the output is not going to change, right? So at that point, you can stop computing. There's no point continuing to compute it further. So it's just a, right? So I can write this, by the way. So I'm writing this as minus summation i j greater than i. So j greater than i captures the minus the half, right? w i j by i y j. But then instead of writing it like so, I can also think of it this way. I can say y equals y1 through yn. And then this means summation wij yij is simply going to be y transpose wy. Right? I can just write this in matrix form. So in matrix form, I can say that the uh, network is going to continue to evolve until the pattern doesn't change. But there's a different way of looking at it. I can say I'm going to compute the energy of the network, and it's going to continue to evolve until the energy no longer changes. Or maybe then uh, the change in energy is very small. Both are equivalent, right? So a Hopfield net we saw as a loopy binary network with symmetric connections. Neurons align themselves to the local field caused by other neurons. Given an initial configuration, the pattern of neurons in the net will evolve until the energy of the network achieves a local minimum. The evolution is going to be monotonic in the energy, because we saw that every flip is going to uh, decrease the energy, right? And so the dynamics mimic those of a spin glass, which we just saw. Specifically, we're looking at symmetric networks where wij equals wgi. You don't really need to have symmetric networks. It's just that uh, analyzing it becomes a little more tedious, but the behavior is not going to be vastly different. And this network acts as a content addressable memory. If you initialize the network with a somewhat damaged version of a local minimum pattern, it will evolve back into that pattern, effectively recalling the current pattern from a damaged or incomplete version. 
So this is all very good. But yes. Pardon me, how do you? There's a pole over here first, and we'll get to that. This one should work, hopefully. Two zero zero eight. Here are the poll numbers. Not good at it. <laughs> All right, guys, let's continue. That was an easy one, okay? So Hopfield networks. The activations in the network evolve until the energy arrives at a local minimum. They are a form of content addressable memory, as we just saw, right? Now, it is not possible to analytically determine what memories are stored simply by analyzing the, the, the weights matrix. That's what makes this complicated. So our question is, how do we make the network store a specific set of memories? How do I make the network remember something very specific? And how many such things can it remember? You can't remember an infinity of patterns using just one network, right? And can we actually sort of, how do we optimize the retrieval and storage of these memories? So let's take a look at this first question first. How do you make the network store a specific pattern or a specific set of patterns? So for example, how do we teach a network to remember this chip and Dale image? Now, if an image has n pixels, then you're going to have one neuron per pixel, correct? And so there's going to be, uh, now there's something, so, so there are going to be uh, n neurons in your image. How many parameters will we have? Now, when we have parameters, I want you to remember something. This figure, has something strange about it. What is wrong about this figure that I drew? Anybody want to take a guess? Who is number 16? Yes, what's wrong with the figure? Uh, it doesn't go back. Uh, this is a, no, this is a, that's not correct, right? Who's, yeah, who's now here? I have two 16s, amazing. So 16 new again, what's wrong with this? <laughs> okay, Does the, did our network have self-connections? It didn't, right? You don't have these guys. Because you don't have a connection back from a neuron back to itself. That's how it differs from a standard MLP infinitely deep standard MLP, right? Who's eight? How many weights will this have? Look at my figure. Yeah, maybe uh, nine minus one squared plus uh, function, the bias. This is, uh, imagine the bias, ign ignore the bias for now, right? Sorry, now the n by n minus one. So there's n squared because each of the n connects to every one of the n, right? But I don't have self-connections, right? And then the whole thing is symmetric. So n squared minus n over two, right? There are different ways of arriving at it, but if you think of it as an unrolling, the, the arithmetic becomes much simpler. But this is, a, this, this is the same as the summation of series that you learned in school, right? So you have n times n minus one weights over two weights in all. And that's what we have to learn. Now, something over here. When I write it like so, a network that stores a pattern P also stores a pattern minus P. 
So who is number one? Who is one? Yeah. Yes, can you tell me why something that stores P would also store minus P? Look at this equation here. Yeah. Thing, that's right, right? If I wrote, if this was minus y, minus and minus would cancel out, right? So if y is a minimum, minus y is also a minimum. So there's naturally a asymmetry over there. Second, so what we want to do is to design our network, the weights, such that the specific patterns we want have minimum energy in the energy contour. So we want those to be those values, right? While remembering that every stored pattern is actually two stored patterns. So we want to design the WIJs such that the energy is a local minimum at the patterns that we are trying to store. Now let's go, let's see how this can be done. Now when you store a pattern, Here's what happens. The pattern has, there are two characteristics over here for storing a pattern. First, take a look at this energy contour. If I have, what happens at each neuron? Each neuron says y goes to sine of field, right? That's the behavior at each neuron. If the field is negative, the neuron becomes negative. If the field is positive, then the neuron becomes positive. When will this stop changing? If for every neuron, y is the same as the field of the neuron itself, at the neuron itself, right? So this means that we want, if I give you a pattern where y equals sine of field, for every neuron. And if I initialize the network at this pattern, then number 14, will the network change? Will it evolve? No. It should not, right? Because there's no reason for any neuron to flip its sign. So this means this thing is stationary. For something to be a memory, the memory pattern must be a stationary pattern. But there's a second characteristic that is that we're interested in. And can number 17 take a guess as to what that would be? 17, yeah. It's a, so there's a second characteristic that we want for something to be called a memory. That is a tough question. Let me answer you, right? If I, if I change some of the bits, it must evolve back into that memory pattern, correct? Otherwise, you're not really remembering it. Now, suppose, it, let me give you an example. If I have an energy contour of this kind, out here, small changes, change, the, the uh, uh, locally, the derivative of the energy is zero, right? So every single, every single bit is going to be stationary. But if I change a single bit, it's going to roll down to the value, right? So it's stationary, but it's not stable. Out here, if I change a bit, it's going to come back to the bit, right? So stationary, and the second, so the second requirement is stable, meaning y plus epsilon should go back to y. These are the two characteristics you want for something to be a valid memory. At the minimum, you want it to be stationary. Ideally, you also want it to be stable. If you put jitter it a bit, you want it to come back. And the larger this epsilon is, the more, the more robust that particular memory is, right? So we want the sign of the field at every neuron to be the same as the sign of the neuron itself. That's stationarity. That is something we require, right? 
For this, we're going to use Hebbian learning. How many of you remember uh, Hebbian learning? Who's number nine? Who is nine? There is a nine. Yes, what was Hebbian learning? Product of the weight and input? Okay, who is 10? Who's 10? Someone is 10. I know we gave out 10. Okay, if nobody's 10, Viraj, what was heavy in learning? <laughs> Can somebody else help these guys? What was heavy and learning? It takes exactly three months for you to remember everything that was taught in the first class. Yes? Those neurons that fire together, wire together. Thank you. Neurons that fire together, wire together. Anybody remember that? Right? So what did that translate to in terms of weights? No idea. What does that translate to in terms of weights? Basically said the weight for any connection was the product of the input and the output. Remember? That was Hebbian learning. And so what we can do is just say WJI equals YJYI. So if you have a target pattern, I can just set the pattern over here. And I know each neuron influences every other neuron. And if I want this to be stable, I'm going to say the weight between this neuron and this one, which is this guy here, is going to be the product of these two bits. That's it. OK, that's my standard simple, simple Hebbian learning, learning rule. And if I use Hebbian learning, it's very easy to show that the thing is stationary. Why? So WGI equals YJYI, right? So at, for any given neuron, the field is WGI times YJ over all of the remaining neurons, correct? But WGI was simply YI, YJ, right? I just wrote this down here. So there's a sum over all of the remaining neurons of YJ times YI times YJ, right? Which is the same as YI times YJ squared, where YJs are all the remaining neurons. All the remaining neurons either take the value plus 1 or minus 1. Regardless of the value that they take, the squared value is 1, right? So this whole thing simply becomes summation over all j not equal to i, yj squared times yi. So what is the sign of this one? yj squared is just going to be a positive term. yi comes out. The sign of this is the same as yi itself. So if I use Hebbian learning, this simple rule guarantees that it will give you a stationary pattern, right? So it's a very simple way of setting the network's weights of the network to store a particular memory. I just say that every weight is going to be the product of the bits. So when you do that, the pattern is guaranteed to be stationary. Now, what about stability, right? This guy, we, we, we have two, two requirements, stationarity and stability, right? Now let's go back and look at the total energy in the network. The total energy in the network is simply this term over here. Remember, it's minus of the summation over all pairs of WIJ times YIYJ, correct? Which is WGI simply by, it was again just YIYJ, right? So this is summation of YI squared YJ squared, right? Which is simply going to be minus of N times N minus one. This is the lowest value that the energy in the network can take. So this is a guarantee that this is a minimum. And because all the weights are either plus one or minus one, because the weights are just products of bits, right? So this is guaranteed to be the lowest energy the network can take. What does that mean? If I flip a bit, what will happen? It's going to go back to the minimum, right? And so this is also guaranteed st stable. It's not only stationary, it's also stable. Now, suppose, so the pattern is stable. So we've shown that using the simple Hebbian learning rule, 
you can get both stationary and stable patterns, right? Now, let's take a look at what these energy patterns look like. Now, before I continue over here, you guys must have wondered, what kind of equation is this? Is this a, is this linear, quadratic, exponential, com more complicated, what kind of equation is that? That's a quadratic, right? If it's a quadratic, how many minima and maxima will it have? Just one. How did my, how did my, how did I claim that there were multiple local minima? Anybody want to guess? So here is, so here is what happens. For this to hold true, W must have a very specific property. First, a quadratic looks like a bowl, correct? It can be an inverted bowl. If it's a bowl of this kind, then what can you tell me about the eigenvalues of W? Lecture three. Guys, suppose I give you summation W ij, xi, xj. And if this is a bowl, what can you tell me about the eigenvalues of W? Okay, simple quadratic, right? Suppose I give you something of this kind, ax squared plus bx plus c. And if I tell you that this thing has a shape of this kind, what can you tell me about A? Positive, remember? Okay, and so if I give you minus of this guy and I tell you A is positive, then what is the shape going to be? It's going to be an inverted bowl, correct? And so this, the way it's set up, you see this thing over here? This works if Now suppose, do I want my network to be of this kind, where it has an energy with a unique minimum, or do I, do I want my network to be of this kind, where it has a unique maximum? Which one do you want it to be? Anyone want to take a guess? Do you want it to have be a minimum or a maximum? Not really, right? There's only one memory that can be stored if you have something of this kind. You want something of this kind, and now here's what happens. All of the bit patterns are plus ones and minus ones, right? So that means regardless of where you start, there are only, so suppose I draw the energy contour, and let's say the energy contour looks like this from the top, the peak is in the minimum. The, these corners, which are your binary bit patterns, are the only values that are valid, right? And so if you go down the bowl, you're going to find that the edges of this boundary, they form a jagged pattern. Some will be high, some will be low, and the lowest local points are going to be a local minimum. That's where the patterns get stored. So although it's a quadratic, W has to be positive definite. That's when the minus of the energy is going to be an inverted bowl. So you want W to be positive definite. Otherwise your bowl is going to have a nonsensical shape, correct? And then specifically, the energy bowl, you're not going to be allowed to be anywhere over here because the values are all plus ones and minus ones, which means the only places where the, the uh, network can live is going to be at these corners. And then if you initialize, say, look at this figure, and this figure, this guy has a higher, these two guys have higher energies than these two guys, correct? So if I initialize the network over here, it's going to travel, it's going to evolve to the next closest corner on the hypercube. 
and it's going to keep doing that till it cannot go down any further, right? Now, here's what I've done. I'm trying to store a four-bit pattern over here. If I have a four-bit pattern, how many of you remember Carnot maps? Okay, how many of you don't remember Carnot maps? Okay. You remember Carnot maps? Can you explain to her what a Carnot map is? Okay, but there was more to it than that, right? It is basically an expression. You can reduce the expression, a binary expression. You're speaking of Boolean functions. There was something more about the arrangement itself. What was that? Any two adjacent pixels, cells, have only a one bit change. So this is a completely topologically continuous representation of the bit pattern, right? So, so this is a Carnot map. And if, let's say, I'm trying to remember this bit pattern, right? Then I would just use Hebbian learning. And I can use Hebbian learning to set the energies, uh, to set the network. And at each position, I can plot the energy of the function as a color. If I do that, when I'm trying to remember just this one pattern, you can see that there are only two patterns over here which have high energy, which, what are the two? Anybody want to guess? So who is number three? Yeah, so what would the two patterns be? So then maybe you can tell me. OK, P and minus P, right? If you flip every bit, that two is remembered. So you're going to, for everything that you try to remember, you're going to see two of these guys with local uh, minimum energies. And now look at what happens over here. Anytime you initialize the network in some cell, it's going to move to a, to a nearby cell if it has a lighter color, if it has a lower energy. And you can see regardless of where you start this network at, it's going to keep moving towards lower energies till it arrives at a yellow cell. So this pattern is perfectly remembered, right? But then suppose I want to store more than one pattern. In our examples, we saw we were actually storing more than one pattern, right? Then what happens? Then I can just use Hebbian learning and average over all of the patterns that I'm trying to store. And if I do this, there's a problem, right? The weights that are good for one pattern may not be good for another pattern. So in the process of trying to remember one pattern, I can end up damaging the other pattern. So, if I, so this problem comes back to how many patterns can we store? And to see this, let's take a look at this, right? Uh, John Hopfield, who originally proposed this network, sh uh, showed through some math that for a network of n neurons, you can store up to 0.15 n patterns. 0.15 n random patterns, right? So what do we mean by random patterns? If I flip a coin to choose the bits, then to, for, if I flip a coin to choose the bits for the bit pattern that I'm trying to store, then I can choose. A, they can, then I can store up to 0.15 n patterns, where the probability of remembering a pattern, of forgetting a pattern, is less than 0.004. So he had a threshold. It's always going to be stochastic, right? He worked through a whole bunch of arithmetic. I'm not going to go through the math, but basically he showed that to have a less than 0.4 percent probability that a stored pattern will not be stable. Then you need the number of patterns to be stored of, of the order of 0.14. Now, this is horrible. If I have a 100 neuron network, in your standard location address memory, you can store 2 raised to 100 patterns, right? Or something of that kind. You can store pretty much anything. Over here, you're only storing a fraction of the number of bits as a content addressable memory. So it's kind of a wasteful representation. And this also only works if the patterns are random. The patterns that you're trying to choose are random. Clearly, we don't work with random patterns. We will, the patterns that we're trying to store have some structure to them, right? So how does it actually behave? So when I say two patterns, are, the patterns are random, it means that on average, if I take any two patterns, the number of bits in which the two patterns match will be the same as the number of bits in which the two patterns don't match on average, right? 
So if I have two patterns where the number of matching bits is exactly the same as the number of non-matching bits, then the two patterns are said to be orthogonal. If the patterns are randomly chosen, the, exp the expectation is that, any, that all the patterns are going to be orthogonal to one another, right? So if I do that, let's see how this works. Again, this is the energy uh, representation. I'm trying to store one pattern. And if I use heavy and learning, that's the kind of energy, for energy uh, contour that you get, right? If I try to store two patterns, I've got two patterns over here, both of which are orthogonal. And what we find is that both of the patterns and their mirror images are local minima. They are bright yellow. There are no other local minima. And here is the interesting thing. Regardless of where you start, you can see that the network is going to evolve to one of these two patterns. The prob problem is you don't know which one it's going to evolve to, but it's guaranteed that it's going to evolve to one of these two patterns. Now, if I've got these guys, here's something crazy about this. You'd think this is good, but this is not, right? What we are finding is that just the two patterns that we want are per have low energy, and the rest of them don't. Is this a good energy contour? I'm going to claim that it's not. Can anybody tell me why not? I'll show you why. Actually, in this case, it's actually good, so I'll leave this. Uh, We'll have other examples later. But here, of course, regardless of where you start, it's going to evolve into one of the two patterns. So but the thing is, this is the four-bit network. And clearly, I'm able to store two patterns perfectly well, right? That's less than, that's much more than 0.14 times 4. I'm actually able to store two patterns. I can show you I can even store three patterns, right? So what does it mean by saying a neuron can, you can, a network of n neurons can store 0.14 and random patterns? That's a fuzzy statement. And uh, you know it's unclear that this is even true. Now, maybe this is because NS4 is a really bad example. So let's take a look at something more complex. This is a 6-bit Carnot map. And in a 6-bit Carnot map, again, if I try to store one pattern using, using Hebbian learning, you can see that it's perfectly stationary and stable in the sense that regardless of where I start, there is a path through which it can evolve until it's going to eventually arrive at that pattern, if it's close enough. If you're very far, you can't say, right? If I'm trying to store two patterns, again, you have the same structure. You can see that those two patterns and their mirror images are the only ones that are locally, uh, local minima. And uh, except if you're, say, at 0, 1, 1, right? The 0, 1, the first column in the middle, there are some places which are kind of stable. And if you start off at that point, all the adjacent uh, pixels, or the adjacent patterns, have either the same energy or, uh, or higher energy, so it's not going to evolve. But if you start off in the neighborhood of a valid pattern, that's actually going to evolve into that pattern. So these are two orthogonal patterns, six-bit patterns. Or if I have two non-orthogonal six-bit patterns, now here's something interesting. When I try to store two non-orthogonal patterns, you have those patterns I'm trying to store and their mirror images. But there are other local minima, what we will call parasitic memories. And if you start off the network close to these local minima, it's going to evolve into those local minima. Right? So this is, I'm trying to store three patterns. And again, I won't go to, you can, you can sort of look at the figures on the slides what you will find is that these three patterns are, again, stationary and they're stable. Meaning if you start off close to these three patterns, then uh, the network is going to evolve into one of these three patterns that, it's trying, that you've tried to store. So here, I'm trying to store four patterns. And I can actually store four patterns. You know, again, we don't have time for me to go over each of these figures and explain why I'm able to store these four patterns. But what we find is that in a sixth neuron network, I'm actually able to use Hebbian learning to store up to four patterns. And in these, point, in these cases, uh, the uh, four patterns are all perfectly recalled for small, for small perturbations, meaning you're either going to, if you perturb the network a little bit, you're, or if you start off from some random location, you're going to end, off in, end up in one of these four patterns or one of their mirror images. But not entirely so. There are also some 
here I'm trying to store six patterns. And in this case, things may break down. Anyway, so right. So there are a couple of things that happen. First, that A, I'm able to store more than 0.14 n patterns, which is the analysis that Hopfield used originally, to, which is the number that Hopfield originally came up with to say, if you're trying to store random patterns using Hebbian learning, then you can get up to 0.14 n patterns. If you have more than 0.14 n patterns, then at that point, there is no guarantee that any of your patterns is going to be stable or even stationary, right? But then whatever analysis he came up with is obviously not, in, not sufficient, right? Because we're able to see the, just by plotting these energy plots that you can get more than 0.14 n patterns. In a six bit network, I was able to store four, four patterns which are perfectly stationary and somewhat stable. But it comes at a cost of something. There are other patterns that the network remembers. These are your so-called ghost memories. What are these ghost memories? If I look over here, there are other locations like this guy here the uh, fourth element from the top, from the bottom, which is a local, which is, which is somewhat yellow. It's not bright yellow, right? But if you start off in the neighborhood of that point, the network is going to evolve to that point. So this is a ghost memory. It's a fake memory. It's, a, it's something that the network was not supposed to remember, but it does, right? This happens to you and me. We have fake memories all the time. It's very easy to know that, you know, it's very easy for even human beings to develop fake memories. You can sort of explain them off as, these local spurious local minima in your in the network that is your brain, but this happens, right? So how why do they happen? Because parasitic memories are local minima of this kind, and specifically if you use Hebbian learning, which we just saw, where the Hebbian learning basically says that I'm going to sum over all of the patterns I'm trying to store, the product of the pairs of neurons to compute the weight, right? then if I take any three patterns that I'm trying to store, then the sum of those three patterns is a local minimum. You can sort of prove this. So Hebbian learning has this problem that even when it actually helps you learn things, it creates spurious memories, okay? So the conclusion is it seems possible to store more than 0.14 n patterns which is to say it's possible to make more than 0.14 n patterns at least one bit stable, meaning I can flip at least one bit and have it go back to the memory. And the interesting thing is that if you have patterns which are very far apart, the farthest apart are two patterns where the number of bits that match is the same as the number of bits that don't match. That, in fact, turns out to be the most challenging case. You would expect that if I'm trying to store very different memories, that would be easier for me to remember. That, it turns out, is not the case. The, what we can remember best uh, is when there's some kind of a correlation between the patterns that we're trying to remember, which might seem either intuitive or counterintuitive, depending on how you look at it. But there's a mathematical foundation to this still, right? So, but overall, when I just try to use Hebbian learning over here, there doesn't seem to be a lot of control over what the network will remember and what it will not remember, right? It might remember the patterns you're trying to store, but there's going to be a whole bunch of other junk. So can we actually try to make this more controlled, make this somewhat more, uh, uh, store, store things better? So just going back, network memory can be trained by Hebbian learning. A network can be designed to store design memories, desired memories. Memory patterns must be stationary and they must be stable. And the network can be trained just by Hebbian learning, which guarantees that a network of n bits trained okay, can store up to 0.14 n patterns with a less than 0.4% probability of not being able to remember a specific pattern. However, empirically, it seems that we can actually store many more than 0.14 n patterns. So, uh, I'll skip this poll, but basically what we are saying is we can try to assign memories to a Hopfield network through Hebbian learning of the weights matrix, and not all patterns trained through Hebbian learning will be remembered. Also, the n-bit Hopfield network has the capacity to remember many more than 0.14 n patterns as we just saw. So how do we explain this? Now first, 
here's a bold claim that you can always store up to n orthogonal patterns such that they are stationary. Now, why is that the case? For y, it's very easy to explain. Remember, if I say y equals w y, right? Some lambda y. Does anybody remember this? What does this look like? Now, if I have an n, n neuron network, what is the size of W? It's n cross n, correct? How many eigenvectors with, uh, will an n cross n network have? n. If all of the eigenvalues of the n are, are positive, then that's a positive definite weights matrix, right? In that case, will this relationship hold for at least n vectors? It's going to, correct? Because an, a, a matrix with an n cross n matrix has n eigenvectors. If all of them have positive eigenvalues, then you're going to get lambda y equals wy, which means the sign of lambda y is the same as the sign of y itself. The sign of wy is the same as the sign of y itself, right? Which means the pattern is stationary, right? So it's fairly trivial to show that you can always build a network that has and stationary patterns. The problem is not stationarity, the problem is stability, right? And so the other thing is you get spurious memories because of these local minima, right? So one of the simple ways of escaping local minima, whenever it recalls a memory, you add some noise, you let it evolve, and you can add noise to uh, eliminate spurious memories. But then, the bottom line here is that with a network of n units, the actual number of stationary patterns you can store is actually exponential in n. It's not just n. The real problem is just because a pattern is stationary doesn't mean it's a pattern you want to remember, right? So how many patterns can you control for and make the network remember? And that one, the proof is that you can store up to n patterns where you actually control for this to be stationary and stable. So the question is, how do we find that network? And whenever you store these n patterns, it comes at the cost of parasitic memories. How do you control for the parasitic memories? And so this is where we actually get into the interesting portion. Maybe I can get through the, the remaining in about seven minutes. Let's go back and look at the energy function, right? The energy function is simply minus half y transpose wy minus by, right? Now, what do I want this energy to be? I want the energy to be minimum at the, uh, at the patterns that I want to remember, correct? So I want to estimate w and b such that the energy is minimum for the patterns I'm trying to remember and it's maximum, as large as possible for all the patterns I don't want to remember. So that when I start at that point, it evolves to the patterns that I'm actually trying to remember, right? So we want to store n patterns. So I can define the energy this way. I can define an objective function this way, which is the sum of the energy of all of my, of the patterns I'm trying to store. And now I can just try to train learn my w to minimize this e of y, correct? This becomes an optimization problem. This is quadratic, and I can just do this, right? If I try to minimize the total energy of all of the patterns that I'm trying to remember, I learn something. But what would the problem with the something of this kind be? Anybody want to guess? Anybody? Okay, the problem is this doesn't guarantee what happens. Just take a look at this guy, right? I'm trying to minimize E of Y. So who is Levin? What is the answer to this? What y, W will minimize this guy? What if I sent every W component to minus infinity? what will happen, or plus infinity. This is going to just minimize this guy, right? That is not a satisfactory solution. Just saying minimizing the total energy at the patterns I'm trying to remember is not good enough. 
That just means that I'm going to get some nonsensical solution, right? It will, you'll end up with a network which remembers everything. A network that remembers everything is, not, is no network at all. I mean, if, if, you can re, if you can remember things that didn't happen, then your memory is useless, right? So what more do we want? We want, it, want to minimize the energy at the target patterns. We want to maximize the energy of all the non-target patterns, right? And so the way you would do it is you're going to redefine your objective function, which is to say you want to take the total energy of all the target patterns, subtract from it the total energy of all patterns which are not target patterns. And this is the term you're trying to maximize or minimize, right? So reduce the energy of the targets and increase the energy of the non-targets. And the easy way to do it is gradient descent. You can just take the derivative. If you take the derivative of y transpose wy, that's just yy transpose, right? So this guy here is the sum of yy transpose of all the target patterns. This guy here is the sum of yy transpose of all the non-target patterns. Now yy transpose is simply the product of the bits every pair of bits. So that's just Hebbian learning. The first component is just straight up Hebbian learning, right? You're just performing Hebbian learning over all the target patterns. The second component is Hebbian learning on the patterns you're not trying to remember. And so the interesting thing that happens is what we saw as Hebbian learning, which we saw worked, is basically one component of it. It's pulling, out, pulling down the energy of the patterns that you're trying to remember but that's not enough. You want to push up the energy of all the patterns that you don't want to remember. So you simultaneously perform Hebbian learning on the first set and unlearning on the other set, okay? This problem here, so furthermore now, suppose some patterns are more important to remember than others, then you can do something very simple. In that first summation, you can repeat the number of times the pattern is presented to increase its importance, right? I'm going to go over by a couple of minutes. There isn't a lot. So that's just, uh, so more repetitions is greater emphasis, right? The second term is a problem. How many patterns do I have that I don't want to remember? That's going to be exponential. If I have an n bit network, I have two raised to n possible patterns, right? Of these, I may be trying to store up to maybe n patterns, but the remaining is still two raised to n, more or less. And so the second term has to be summed over an exponential set. And that's going to be too much, right? So here's how we will do this instead. I'm going to, again, this is what the energy contour is going to be like. You know, this is actually going to be like a, the inverted quadratic as we saw, right? And then these might be the target patterns. So if I set off some, with some, some random initial weight, then the energy contour is going to have some shape of this kind, right? These are the target patterns where I want to lower the energy. These are all the patterns where I want to increase the energy of the network. And if I do this right, then I'll end up with a network where I have bowls with the minima of the patterns that I'm trying to remember, and everywhere else it's sort of going up, okay? Except the number of points at which I'm trying to pull the network up is exponential in number but I don't really need to sum over all of those, right? I can just focus on the valleys. I say, just go to the valleys and pull up the network values at the valleys and pull down the energy at the target patterns. So if I do that, then this summation over here, the gradient descent, the gradient that you're computing, the first term is still the summation over all of the target patterns. The second term, where I'm trying to pull up the network's energy, that only has to be over the, over the valley. So again, observe that this is the, the combination of two Hebbian learning rules. The first is at the target patterns. The second is the patterns which where I'm trying to pull up the energy, right? And how do you identify these valleys, right? How can we actually identify the valleys? There can be any number of valleys, so it's really hard, right? The way you could do it is just to say, I'm going to randomly initialize the network and let it evolve. Anytime it stops, that's a valley. If it's a pattern that I'm trying to remember, I don't bother. 
if it's a pattern that I'm not trying to remember, I'm going to add that term into my, into the second correction term, right? But even that is not enough. So, so here's what I'd do. I'd initialize W, compute the first term, which is the total outer product for target patterns, randomly initialize the network several times, let it evolve to a local valley, and then compute the outer terms, outer product terms for the valleys. The difference between the two is going to be the gradient that I use to adjust my weights matrix, right? So uh, anyway, or if I want to do this there using SGD, then I'm going to sample a target pattern that I'm trying to remember. I'm going to compute the outer product of the target pattern. Then I'm just going to randomly initialize the network till it arrives at a valley. I compute that outer product. This difference would be the term that I used to adjust the weights, right? But then I can do something else. Do I need to randomly initialize the network each time I'm trying to find the value? It turns out no. It turns out that I'm really interested in keeping my memory stable, right? Which means I don't want any value near the memory that I'm trying to store. At faraway locations, I don't really care. So what I will do is I will now initialize the network at the memory location that I'm trying to store and then let it evolve, right? So I would start here at each of these locations, let the network evolve till it got to the nearest valley and only pull out those, pull up those valleys. And so that gives me this updated rule where I initialize the network with each target pattern, let it evolve. And so corresponding to each target pattern, I'm going to have the nearest valley. And I'm going to use the difference between the outer products at the target pattern and the valley to compute my gradient with which I adjust my W. So this is the uh, simplified version. But then I can, I can simplify this one step further, right? If I start off with a target pattern and let it evolve, and let's say the target pattern just happens to be in the bowl of another pattern that I'm trying to remember. Then when it evolves, I'm going to end up at the other target pattern. I'm going to end up forgetting the other pattern that I'm trying to remember, right? So you can do something even simpler. There's no need to raise the entire surface or even every valley. You just raise the neighborhood of each target pattern. And then that guarantees that the target pattern is in some sort of a bowl. Right? So this means what you would do is you would start at this location, let the network evolve for a small number of st time steps, one or two, just a few bits. That gives you a new pattern. And that is the pattern that you're actually going to use in the outer product, second outer product, to adjust your gradient. Right? So there's the entire sequence of logic over here, which is very simple once you visualize it, what you're actually trying to do when you're adjusting these weights. And so uh, we're going to use this guy to actually learn the weights. We'll stop right here. The point is networks that store up to n memories for an n-bit network can be trained by appropriately optimizing the weights by defining an objective function and minimizing it using gradient descent. And specifically, when you do that, the objective function can be arbitrarily complex. It can be exponentially large. But then by using some uh, small number of fairly uh, common sense corrections to the update rule, the whole thing actually becomes tractable. Right? So in the next class, we'll sort of take this to the next step and talk about Boltzmann machines, which are a huge field, by the way. And uh, we'll just sort of touch upon it. But the whole point is it starts off with Hopfield networks, which is why we actually started off with Hopfield networks. Yes. Um, so our target patterns, they have the lowest energy, right? That's the, that's the whole point. Right. Can't we like, set this threshold of energy and say that anything that's above this energy is pulled up? So that the point, that, that's correct. The problem is that if I have like a thousand bit network, mm -hmm. but think of that, uh, uh, the Chippendale picture. That's probably like a 200,000 pixel image. That's two raised to 200,000 possible patterns. Mm -hmm. So to find out the ones where the energy is high is going to be very complicated, right? So you sort of go and pick the ones which matter. 
which are close to the chip end there and just pull those up, that's all. It means that the that it didn't actually store. So remember this: you want this guy to be your target pattern. So ideally, the energy contour should be like this. What this means is that it learns something like this, where the actual pattern you're trying to store is slightly off, and so the noise remains. All right. Anyway, all right, guys. Wednesday is your last class. So see you all on Wednesday, and good luck with everything.